David Waits is the president and CEO of SST Software, a technology uh, development company focused on applying GIS and GPS technologies to production agriculture. Founded in 1994, SST provides information management technologies to customers in 44 states and 22 countries. More than 50 universities and community colleges worldwide use SST software for teaching and research. Dr. Waits brings a unique approach to precision farming with his experience and knowledge in the fields of agriculture, geography, and land management. He has 10 years experience as a farmer in southwestern Kansas and five years experience teaching university level GIS and remote sensing as a professor at Oklahoma State University. Uh, Waits holds a PhD in land management from Texas Tech University and two degrees from Oklahoma State University, a master's degree in geography and a bachelor's degree in economics. Please help me welcome Dr. Waits. Uh, Chris is a uh, Stillwater native. He was born outside of Stillwater and went to school at Ripley. And he's a carpenter by trade. He didn't do the college thing. He just went, went straight into the field. And he was building a bar for somebody who really liked his work. And the guy said, you know, I really like these shutters in this house. Could you find me these shutters? And he found the shutters and priced them out. And he said, I can do these cheaper. So he made the shutters cheaper. He had a little lag time. And from there, it just kind of rolled into what's now Kurtz. And Kurtz started, he had a partner named Kirby, and his name is Teets, so it just made sense to call the company Kurtz. Um, so it just kind of escalated from there, started in 87, and um, they do custom hardwood shutters. So it, they have no inventory, you order the shutters exactly how you want them when they make them. And it seems like a business, you know, can't be that big, you know, all these custom shutters. But he's done work for Woody Allen, Larry Bird, Kate Hudson, Ashley and Naomi <laughs> Judd. Um, so it's really escalated from there. One of his biggest projects that he liked, the um, guy who started Victoria's Secret, he did his Caribbean home out of pecking cypress. So it's like a cypress tree that has holes in it. So he made shutters out of that. So um, he's found a lot of ways to create a sustainable advantage that he'll tell us about. But I'd like you all to help me in welcoming Christine. is Befar Jahan Shahi, and despite his name, he's a true Oki, born and raised, uh, born in Norman, raised in Stillwater, and while a lot of us were getting drunk and being stupid our sophomore year, he was starting a company. Um, while he was going to school, he started an IT company to help businesses in the area, and um, after he got his master's degree, he had to decide, do I stick with this or do I go find a job in corporate America? And he kind of liked what he was doing, so he kept going. And um, Innerworks, his company, does a number of things, but basically if you want to beef up your IT, companies come to him. Or um, he serves as the CIO in a number of, um, of large companies because it's easier for them to put him on their board than to create a whole IT department. So basically he does IT so well that companies don't have to do it themselves. And He's been listed on the Inc. 5000's list of fastest growing companies in the U.S. for four consecutive years. So he's got a lot of the big companies, you know, Verizon, Medco, um, um, Cisco. They're all coming to him saying, hey, can you help us beef up our IT or can you do this or can you do that? So I'm sure he's got a lot to tell us about tonight, too. So if you all could help me welcome um, Bifar Jahanchi. Thank you, team. So um, I think we'll start where we always start, and that is for you to tell us a little bit about your business. So Mr. Waits, I hope we start with you. Okay. Well, our company is called SST Software. You may have seen our facilities out on the North Country Club Road, about a mile south of the Weed. And uh, so the beer bottles up and down Country Club land on our front yard, okay? <laughs> uh, and as, as was mentioned in that, in that bio, we started SST in 1994. And that was while I was on faculty here at OSU teaching geographic information systems and remote sensing, the geotechniques courses in the Department of Geography and teaching in this, in this building. 
I taught from 1992 through 1997. But I did not ever aspire to be a college professor. I had a very circuitous route. Those of you that, that listened to that, to that bio, I think I need to spend just, a, just a, a couple of minutes on that because it's very important that the progression that I took uh, through my career has, has greatly impacted what we do at SST Software. When I, when I went to college after high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was not a, really a very good student. I wasn't very focused, and I, I tell people I flopped around in college for a couple of years, not, not really getting with it, and, and ended up quitting. Got married and went back to my home in southwestern Kansas, up by Dodge City, Kansas, and farmed with my dad for, for 10 years. And it was a good life, and we had kids and, 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 and did well in, in, in production agriculture, developed some irrigation, and did, did, some, did some innovative things. But I hadn't been home very long, and I realized I'd made a serious mistake by quitting college and that I needed to get back and finish my degree. And it took me a long time to, to get to the point that I was able to do that. My wife and I moved down here to Stillwater in uh, 1984 with two kids and lived in married student housing. And I went to work on finishing my bachelor's degree. And I finished in economics. But I really liked geography. Now, how do you make a living with geography? I took some, I took some coursework here at Oklahoma State as electives in geography, and one of the professors talked in class about a new technology that was coming online, being developed, being refined at that time. We're talking 1986 now at this time, called Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. How many people are, have, have good? Because, you know, five years ago there were less hands, and ten years ago it was hard to get any hands when you ask about GIS. It is becoming more and more mainstream in our society and in our economy. And at that time in 1986, you know, it was, it was, it was hand-waving and drawing diagrams on whiteboards, and, and because we didn't have the technology here at this university to, to really, to really, to, to work with. But I was intrigued with the notion that GIS and, and imagery, like remote sensing, satellite-based imagery, that those geotechniques could and should be applied to production agriculture, which I moved from that 10 years of, of going back and farming. And so I decided that I wanted to do my best to apply geotechniques to, to agriculture and began that quest in uh, 1987. And I entered the master's program in the Department of Geography here. Now, I took, I took a whole lot of, I mean, my people back in Kansas thought I'd gone crazy, you know. What are you going to do, teach state capitals or something, you know, for, for a living? And I don't mean to disparage the discipline of geography in any way. I actually love the discipline. And, and, but, but just think about what that looked like at that time. Well, this, this, new, this new technology, these new techniques, were, were being developed and coming online. And I got in early. I got in on the ground floor of it. And I ended up going down to Texas Tech, doing a PhD in land management. I tell people that I, I went through a doctoral program for the purpose of not getting credentials as much as, as, as trying to learn how to apply these technologies to agriculture and really focused in greatly on that for three or four years. And then, I, I took a position at a, at a commercialization center for NASA's. And it's down at Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. And I went down there as the Ag Program Manager to try to spin a company out of that center. And, and the inducement was that if I could help figure out how to commercialize these technologies in agriculture, then I could go out with this spin-off company and be a principal within it. And I found out after I got down there that, first of all, I hated living there. And second, spinning a commercial company out of a federal facility was not very easily accomplished at that time. 
probably, I don't know if it is now or not. The reason I'm telling you all this is that I had a desire, starting in the 80s, to do my best to build a business around incorporating these geotechniques that I've been, I haven't described them, but I've told you what they are, in, into agriculture, something that I, that I understood. And it was too early to try to really commercialize, although I had tremendous contacts and, 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 and had done well, had done very well in that position. But I just, it just wasn't enough developed at that time to really make a living. Uh, think of a, some of you that, can, can re, do you have any recollection of where the GPS system was at that time? I mean, think back if, or, you know. GPS wasn't even up and operational, but it was being built and we knew it was coming, but you couldn't really go out and use it operationally yet, okay? So we needed, we needed some time for these, for these technologies to develop. And so I ended up applying for a professor position here at Oklahoma State, a place that I dearly love and, and, and did at that time as well, and was fortunate enough to be uh, included on faculty in the Department of Geography. And I taught for five years, but I told everyone when I came on board here that what I really wanted to do was have a business. And normally you don't tell people when you're applying for a job that you really don't want to do that, okay? But I did, and I got hired anyway. And, and the administration was actually very, very helpful in helping me, helping me do this. And what I did in, in starting a business in 1994, two years after I came on board here on faculty, was done with everybody's knowledge and participation at the administration level. I'm talking at College of Arts and Sciences and, and at the President Halligan's office at that level. Okay. And so we, we hung a shingle out in 1994 and we started putting graduate students in position in, in, in this company, starting with just three and then we added four and then five. By 1996, we had seven or eight people. <coughs> And what we ended up doing was building a software product that agriculturalists could use to manage GPS and georeferenced data in agricultural fields, like for soil fertility, you know, yield coming off yield monitors on combines, which is a very infant technology at that time, and to, and to be able to organize the data and to be able to process it, and to, most importantly, to be able to create information products from that data. And we did that as standalone software and sold it like shrink wrap software, like 5,000 bucks a copy and, and then 900 bucks a year to maintain and enhance it on an ongoing basis. And we did very well. We had a very superior offering as early as 1996 and 1997. And, but the model, the model was not right. And I, I hope in later on when we're talking specifically about sustainable competitive advantage yes. that we that I can come back to this but I want to introduce this now that that we, we did well as a company we had customers people loved our stuff but the, the, the model of what they were doing in in cooperatives and seed companies and crop consultancies and all that wasn't wasn't right and what happened over time is we continued to change our approach based on what technology would allow us to do internet becoming so pervasive, computers becoming so cheap and, and, uh, and powerful, and changed our business model over time to where we began to process data online for our clientele instead of selling them software. Now we still create software and sell it, but, but, but it's a lighter, cheaper, more uh, uh, pedestrian uh, technology than what we had before and the main thing we do at our company at SST now is we process data for our clientele and, and in near real time shoot them back deliverables that, that are proprietary to them that let them be different than their competition <coughs> which I saw on your on your, on your board here okay so people can use our service you know, folks that are out there competing with each other can both use our service and get something completely different delivered to them so that they can differentiate themselves in their marketplace. And so that's, that's, really, that's really what we do 
and when we get into uh, the question and answer session, then I'd like to I'd like to uh, um, talk talk more about how that how the business model changed and how our competitive advantage has been greatly improved through that we look forward transformation. To that. We look forward to that. Thank you. And I apologize, Doctor. <laughs> no, and, and let me and, and I know like Doctor Morris and, and and those of you, I mean in academia, I mean that's a title of respect and, and we all respect that. In, in my work, in my business, I have found that I get along a lot better to just lose the doctor, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay? And I don't use it, it's not on the business cards, and I'm only, you know, I mean, when you put a bio out there, you have to say what you did. But I, I, I try very hard to, to be an agriculturalist just like our, just like our customers, and and not even I don't even talk about my academic background at all with our clients. What do you think of that, Dr. Morris? <laughs> <laughs> because you know what I'm saying. I, 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 it just fits better. It, it, it really does. It, it just makes everybody a lot more comfortable, and we don't have to do that. So I just please call me David or. or Actually, would you mind if I called you um, all of you by your first name? That'd be wonderful. Uh -huh. I'd love that. Thank you. Well then, um, Chris, and who would ask? Ask what, you should, what your sustainable advantage was before you even get started. Half the audience would say, I heard Victoria's Secret. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, please, tell us about your business. Well, I'm, I guess maybe what I consider to be the, the true entrepreneur. I don't have a, a formal education beyond high school. I'm a carpenter by trade. I, I knew I wanted to be a woodworker when I graduated high school. I, I skipped my senior trip so I could start to work two days sooner. You know, it was that important to me. I worked in a home building business for about until 13 years or so. I, I learned to build a house from the ground up. But what I really liked was the finer detail that went with the trimming the, the interior of the house, building the cabinetry. Deep down, I always thought I wanted to build furniture, uh, custom furniture uh, for, piece, for people, one of kind pieces type thing. And uh, those of you that have been around a while will understand this uh, boom this boom thing always is followed by a bust in the construction business and uh, I've been through a few of those and it made me begin to wonder if uh, being a carpenter woodworker was ever a very good idea so I had kind of formulated in my mind I was going to someday have a, a small shop and I never thought I'd have more than eight or ten workers alongside me but uh, as things developed Jamie was it mentioned earlier that uh, I did a job for a gentleman. He liked my work. I made some shutters for his home. It was here in Stillwater. And as a result of that, I thought maybe this is a product that I could make and sell uh, because I was tired of that having to find a job, take your tools to the job, you know, get the work done, get paid, pay my employees, that type of thing. So I made some extra samples after I finished that first job. And at that time, there was a gentleman I worked with, and we decided that since he knew more Oklahoma City home builders, he would go to Tulsa, or to Oklahoma City area. And since I could talk to a fence post and be rather convincing, <laughs> it'd be my job to go to the area where I knew nobody and try to find people who would be interested in buying a product. So I went to Tulsa area, and. Uh, in the form, spirit of a true entrepreneur, you know no strangers, you tell everybody about what you have, you're excited about it, and uh, I would go to home builders, interior designers, if I found a house under construction, if I found a house being remodeled, uh, it didn't bother me to go up and try to find, okay, who's the builder, who's the decorator, who's the homeowner, here's what I do, you need this. And uh, about the time I was ready to give up on the business, because it was difficult to young families both trying to raise families out of a small business we decided to work a home show in Tulsa and it was kind of strange because I, as I reflect back on that we it was a four-day show and uh, I actually talked so much at that show I was hoarse by the time the show was over and I screamed at a lot of ball games and lost my voice real early <laughs> second or third quarter maybe but I never talked until I was hoarse but I did that weekend but we were just at a point where we were about to give up and in fact the week after the show my business partner at that time 
was going to go to Connecticut and work for a, a former employee of mine who had gone there to find work. And while he was gone for two weeks, the, week, the two weeks after the show, I, I sold $50,000 worth of shutters in Tulsa. And I didn't know I was going to build them, but I kept taking the orders. So. <laughs> and I called and I told the gentleman, I'm not coming to work. We've got enough now. We're staying here. And it seemed like from there we just managed to continue to build product, put it in the marketplace, and people began to find us. And there weren't lots of people doing what we did at that time. So uh, we worked the local home shows and continued to spread the word what we did, and it proved to be effective. After a while, uh, we began to try to spread out a little further. Um, we, through the years, we've worked the international window covering shows, uh, which are going to be held somewhere, usually along the eastern seaboard. This last year was in Las Vegas. This allows us to find people who want to buy and resell our product. Um, little mom and pop window shops, or individuals, small uh, fabricators, not fabricators, usually, but resellers who have customers that want shutters, draperies, blinds, and we try to fill that niche. Uh, the real thing that changed with our business through the years was that all of a sudden shutters became a commodity. Uh, when we first started, we were one of only two or three people in the state that made them. Today, you can buy shutters from a dozen fabricators and a hundred people that resell them. Everybody from Lowe's and Home Depot to uh, you know, blind alley, James Customs, curtains, and everything in between. <coughs> what we try to do to separate ourselves from uh, the standard product in the industry is make what we consider the Cadillac of the industry. Maybe today be more appropriate to say the Lexus of the industry. Uh, a good example of somebody who rested on their laurels and somebody passed them by Cadillac and look where some of the other people in the car companies are today. Well, we try to be unique, we try to be different. Other people made shutters out of softer woods and tried to make it more of a mass production thing. We tried to make it a one of a kind, very unique. We've made shutters out of over 50 different species of woods. We'll make any shape, we'll match any custom finish. So we're truly a job shop compared to a manufacturing facility that puts inventory on the shelf and then goes and pulls to fill orders. Window size is very greatly, so we, uh, we actually have field dimensions either collected by our sales staff or sent to us by uh, people who want to purchase the product and then we'll manufacture it to whatever their specific needs and likes are. Uh, we're still a small company in comparison. Uh, we do occasionally work out of the country, but most of our work is within a 200 mile radius of uh, Oklahoma, prominent in uh, Texas, or, or excuse me, south to Texas, and then uh, Oklahoma up into the southern part of Kansas, northwest Arkansas. Uh, that's probably still 60, 65 percent of our market. Uh, typically, the best thing we can do with our product when it comes to selling it is show it. Just like the gentleman that calls me from California and says, well, I want cherry shutters for my house. Other than me spending a lot of time telling him we think we're the best, we make small samples, I put them in a box and I'll, I'll sell it, send it to them, and that product will sell itself. That gives us a little bit of an advantage because we don't have to talk our way into an order. Usually we think the product will sell itself once it's seen and appreciated. And that's worked effectively for us. Uh, we have tried to diversify the market a little bit from the standpoint of uh, uh, working with the engineering department here at Oklahoma State. We've got a, a grant. We've been working to develop a shutter that's motorized so that you can operate either one shutter or multiple shutters open and closed in the louver form um, with a remote control. We all need a few more remote controls in our life, right? <laughs> one more get lost on down in the couch somewhere or whatever. But uh, that product has not come full circle yet. But it, we're about to complete it. Uh, that, thinks, that looks to be an advantage to us, but overall for a business our size, I would say that I think the key to success for us in a market that has many people offering similar products is to offer something uh, of high quality, uh, good service. Overall, in, in my mind, there's three things for sale. Quality, service, and price, and for the most part, you can pick any two of them 
but you can't be all three. We try to sell quality and service, and we pride ourselves in being one of the most expensive, one of the best, and you should want to pay us more money than somebody else because we feel we have a better product. If you don't believe me initially, listen to me a while, I'll convince you. And that's what I try to help the customer appreciate, and myself people, and the people that wrap our product. Uh, and so that's our advantage if we have one. You're doing, you're, so far, a great job of setting up the questions when we get to a uh, sustainable advantage in detail. This is wonderful. So far. So my name's uh, Bay Farr. I'm a company here in town called Interworks, and I'm just curious, has anyone heard of Interworks in the room? Okay. So um, I started Interworks in, well, first off, let me tell you a little bit about what Interworks does. We're an IT consulting company. Um, it's, it's several sub-businesses under the name Interworks. We do a lot of uh, network infrastructure support. We do a lot of web projects. We do a lot of uh, data analysis and business intelligence projects. And within each of those spaces, we have um, a certain type and size of clientele. So networking-wise, uh, a lot of things that are regional. Um, and, and these are businesses around town. So, so we only focus on B2B. We don't deal with uh, home users or anything of that nature. We're not like the geek squad where we come out and, and uh, fix a, a virus on a, on a PC at home. Uh, a lot of businesses will use us to come in and work on a special project. A lot of times they may have an IT staff or they may turn to us and they have IT staff that comes and goes and they say to us, you know, you guys sort of be that stable, constant uh, force as, as time goes on and advise us on how to standardize our setups, what our networks look like. Um, and, and because we've seen so many networks, the idea is that we can come in and advise them on best practices. So networking, very uh, regionally focused. Um, lots of companies, uh, we work with, with the two gentlemen on, on stage here, we work with clients like the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, the, it, it, again, ranges everywhere. Um, within the website of the business, everything from very small to very large. So uh, occasionally we'll run into, we'll do projects for, you know, let's say an attorney or, or dentist in town uh, to anything like the World Bank. Um, we, we've done sites for companies in Russia, sites for companies in Europe. We do um, law firms that have 400 plus attorneys, really sort of all over the place. And then within the uh, business intelligence and data uh, analysis side of the business, a, a lot of large companies that people have heard of, um, Cisco, Verizon, Verizon Wireless, um, companies of that sort. So we're, we're receiving calls from all over the country saying, can you guys fly out, spend a week with us, spend a month with us, uh, and help us make sense out of the mounds and mounds of data that we have. So each one of those areas come with, with their own set of challenges, their own set of marketing techniques and styles, uh, their own set of uh, types of employees and, and career ambitions, that sort of thing. Um, going back to how the company came to be, so I'm a pretty much pretty much raised in Stillwater, born in Edmond, grew up in Stillwater from the age of three spent most of my pre-college years in student housing with my professor, my, my parents were both professors at some point. Um, I actually spent a lot of time in this building uh, growing up. So I would ride my bike over and there was a computer lab in the basement and back then computer lab was five computers, three of which were IBMs and two of which were you know, typewriters. And, uh, um, the, the faculty and staff sort of took me in. They'd bring me computer games and, you know, they'd hand me discs and I'd have to load them up and it wasn't as easy as just run set up and it's done. There was a whole process that went into it. So I really got into computers at an early age. I love technology. I was very passionate about it. And uh, I was always, you know, just sort of, I guess, entrepreneurial by nature. I mean, even going back to something as simple as a paper route, you know, I mean, I, I took a lot of pride in it and realized if I, took care of uh, the customers, I'd get $20 tips at Christmas, which, you know, when you're in high school, that's a lot. Um, uh, one, you know, paper carry of the year and all that, you know, something I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of to this day. So, uh, you know, growing up, I mean, I was always into computers and setting up a network was not an easy thing uh, back at that time. You didn't just go to Office Depot or Staples or, and pick up a wireless router. 
So, um, contrary to what was said earlier, we did sit around and drink a lot of beer, but we also played a lot of computer games, and we wanted to play those games against each other. And um, to do that, I, I was since I was sort of the computer guy in the group, I had to um, we had to go by cable. Uh, we all lived in an apartment complex behind Eskimo Joe's, Maple 400 Apartments. And we just took a box of cable, got a staple gun, stapled up cable to the side of the complex and just ran it through people's windows. And anyone who was on that side of the complex that wanted to be a part of it, what well, got to be a part of it. Um, I, worked at, I worked at Creative Labs right out of high school for about a year. And you know, at Creative Labs we took, we took tech support calls. One of the calls I got was uh, from a, a guy who worked at a company called 3Com, which makes network cards. And he was having a problem with a lot of computers. And he, you know, I was, I, I knew 3Com, so I was telling him how much I love networking and all that. And he said, I tell you what, if you fix my problem, I will send you a box of network cards. And at that time, 3Com cards were 130 bucks a pop. Again, a lot of money when you're, you know, sophomore in college. So, send me a box of cards. We put them in all my friends' computers. Uh, networked them together. Every night we'd, you know, end up playing video games all night uh, against one another. So, uh, you know, from there I sort of determined, well, computer networks are actually easy. It was fun to do. And uh, we, have, we went, I, I basically decided I'm going to go approach some of the businesses in town who build computers and ask them if they have a need for uh, help in setting up networks for their customers. So these businesses in town at that time we're focused on building computers you know there, Dell, there was no Dell Direct where you call and say send me a computer you would go to a computer store they put the parts together and sell you a computer they had no desire to do anything service related with those computers and we just said well why don't you give us the business and they said okay because we don't want to do it and immediately they just started sending business to us left and right and so from there uh, I, I got into networking um, and you know, you walk in, you're the computer person, and people think you can do anything on a computer. So people would say, "Make me a website. I need a database. I need this. I need that." And we just, I would just say, "Okay," and then go, go learn it. Um, it didn't matter what anyone asked. If they said, "Can you do it?" I just said yes, and then I, <laughs> I'd go figure out. How to do it. And, uh, and and really, I mean, that sort of was the birth of Interworks. By the time I got my, um, so that was '96, my my sophomore year in college got my uh, bachelor's in MIS in 98, my master's in telecom in 2000. And when 2000 rolled around, I thought, you know, I, I don't want to go work for IBM. I don't want to go work for Williams or one of these other big companies and, uh, and, and work for, you know, corporate America. By that time, there was enough revenue coming in from the businesses I picked up that I thought, well, you know, I really like what I'm doing. Why, why end it? And so from there, uh, that's when Interworks was sort of born again, and, um, and and really the business just took a life of its own. So our, in our slowest year of growth, we grew 27% in revenue. Today we have um, 70 employees, a majority of which are in Oklahoma. Uh, we are actually starting to hire quite a bit in, in other metros. So we've got some people like Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, uh, getting ready to make some hires in New York City and Seattle. Um, we've expanded into, uh, our, our client base has expanded into Europe. We're getting ready to go into Latin America um, with some aspects of the, of the business. Um, so it's, it's really, it's been a sort of a hell of a ride the last, I mean, my, the last decade's been sort of a blur from college on just because it's, you know, wake up and hustle. And, and, uh, but for me, this is, I, I love business. I love technology. Uh, for me, I took all of my worlds, and, and they're all in one big bucket. So, you know, wife works at the company. A lot of my friends work at the company. Uh, you know, so for me, it's uh, I, I love what I do. That's so, right. so, so help us um, sort of tease out if there is a difference. So, competitive, competitive advantage and sustainable advantage. What what do they mean to you? Different? Is your sustainable advantage your competitive advantage? Well, so you. well, so you know, it, for for Interworks, I think you know because we work in technology, it's it's changing whether we want it to or not. Everything we do today will probably be irrelevant four years from now. If we go sell a solution to someone, 
we tell them three years we'll be doing something else. With you. So, so we know that this is an ever-changing game uh, for us. So there's always, um, no matter what technology is here to stay, people are always going to come back for more. So yeah, I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout way. I mean, for us, our focus is, at the end of the day, we are a professional services company. We do not sell a product. We are no different than a, a lawyer or an accountant or a plumber. Um, uh, so for us, it's very much about customer service. It's about the soft skills, communicating, uh, showing that we're competent. And um, those were things that I undervalued for the longest time because I just thought everyone knows that. I mean, you know, you know if, you want, if you want business, do, do a good job and be nice and communicate what you're doing. Most people do not get that. Most businesses don't get that. For us, a real, um, the real competitive advantage for us is that, especially in IT, most people don't get that. So just by doing that alone, we're already leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else. You had a slide up that mentioned competition and, and do we, you know, is it dog eat dog or do we, I mean, we're happy to have competition because frankly, uh, a lot of times people leave the competition, come to us and then think more highly of us because they had a bad experience with someone else and then they go tell everyone else you guys should use Interworks because they're so much better than this last company. Mm -hmm. So we actually like competition as long as they're not that great. So they should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about, well I, I really kind of side with him on that idea of uh, pleasing the customer first and foremost. Uh, we live in a society today where it's pretty much you, you go to the store, you want to find something in the store, you better be determined to keep looking because there's nobody that comes along and says, can I help you? And uh, we've always prided it in that we've never really had much of a marketing budget. You don't need a marketing budget that's spending 10% of your proceeds if you take care of the customers you have because they'll advertise for you. Good example, a lady recently called and inquired about a purchase for shutters for a home and the salesperson started to kind of give a quick pitch and she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. She said, listen, you please my mother. If you can please her, you can please anybody. You've got the job, just come do it. Well, that's when people recognize that, and we work in very upscale homes. Most homes we work in are, I'd say a half million dollars and up. Biggest one so far is like $40 million. Well, you get those jobs because you make a great product and you give good service. And we've worked real hard through the years to let our customer service be the thing that can please people. Because I think I read one time real early in business about every customer that's unhappy tells 11 people. And every uh, customer that is happy will tell one. So you better not make very many people mad or you have to work a long time to find enough customers. So gentleman called this week, bought two little bitty shutters. He wanted them with a fly spec on them as a little black dots, like what they were doing back in 1978 when they built his house. We got his shutters, he didn't think the spots were big enough. So guess what? We're putting bigger spots on them at my expense because when we're done, he'll advertise more for me than a $1,500 ad in a magazine screaming, buy from me. So, so far from the two I'm hearing, the, the, advan the advantage is the, Gar the Jerry Garcia thing. You're not doing it better, you're doing it different. You're doing things that weren't done before, um, and you're doing that well. The same, the same thing? Um, the question is, are, are they, ask, ask the question again, please. Well, the same, is your sustainable advantage the same as your competitive advantage? Yeah, well, I, don't, I don't think they're the same. Um, to me, the competitive advantage, I mean, I mean, I look at it from our client's point of view, they're going to look at, at their, all their options for getting these information products, I'm going to call it, out of, you know, are they, are they going to buy, are they going to buy our desktop software? Are they going to buy somebody else's desktop software? Are they going to use an online data processing solution from us, or from somebody else? So there's, there's, you know, there's, there's other ways, there's other ways to get to the end here. Okay, whatever this information product is, and our competitive advantage is 
that we got to make sure that our solution is better. It's more attractive. It's got to be more efficient, or it's got to cost less, or or uh, it's it's got to be what they prefer from from all the options that they have from our competition. And we try to make sure that when they when they have the whole milieu of options in front of them, that they'll choose us. All right. And sustainable advantage to me connotes that. Whatever it is we're doing, we better be able to do it for a long, long time without some disruption or some something changing our our program or our way of making of making a living. And so, what what we're trying to do in our business is to make sure that that the solutions that we provide are scalable because everybody gets more and more and more data in these systems all the time and they want bigger and better information products delivered from them and 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 such that there's not going to be some disruptive technology that comes in and takes it away from us and so we're very very conscious of of making sure that what we're doing is state of the art if it costs more money for servers and a bigger newer oracle system that came out, we've got to do those things in order to, to, to keep that thing tracking and, and sustainable. And we, we're trying to do that in a way that's, that's more competitive than anybody else in the industry. So I heard, I heard, three, I heard three very distinct um, sort of value propositions. So it's not just a thing to have it, how you package it, how your customer embraces it, how they ought to know that. So how do you build what you just said about quality and customers, and you build that, how does that affect your, your business model? How do you build this into how you, how you make money, how you continue to make money, how you continue to make profits? How do you build all of that? What's your business look like in terms of that? And all the great things you do for your customers? Well, in our instance, and I, and I know I'm, it, it, it's very difficult. How many people had a chance to look at our website, SST software website? Anybody get a chance to look at it? Okay, good. So it's a, it's a little bit difficult for me to describe this when, when you guys don't know exactly what it is I'm talking about here, okay? Because it, I'm sure it seems in the abstract. But, but, but what, what we're doing is performing operations on data that's collected inside a georeferenced field boundary. Think of it like, like pulling up georeferenced imagery on screen drawing or digitizing a 80 acre or 97 acre field boundary. Okay, Jamie, you're with me on this. And within that field boundary, you're going to collect soil samples. And maybe you're going to do that on a systematic aligned grid. Every two and a half acres, you're going to use GPS to navigate to a point, and you're going to pull a soil sample at that point, and you're going to go to the next point, which is 330 feet that way, and you're going to collect another soil sample, and you're going to, you're going to get data you're going to analyze the soil to find out what the levels of phosphorus, potassium, soil pH, cation exchange capacity, on and on and on is for those points. Well, the process that, that we perform on the data once it's sent to us would be to, to create a surface of variability for each of those nutrient levels. Okay, that's just, that's just one example. I'm just trying to give a concrete example of, of what it is we're doing. So we're going to perform some process that they tell us what it is on, on a field boundary. And so we get paid, every time they place an order on a field, we get paid for that process on a per acre basis. So if it's a 92 acre field, we get 92 acres times 90 cents an acre to perform that process. Okay, so it's like a 24-7 it's like online ordering system. And, but each customer has to get set up with a proprietary package that's available to them using their agronomy, their methodologies, their algorithms, their procedure sets, whatever it is. Okay? And so our programmers are, are in there constantly customizing what it is, Jamie, you're going to do in southeastern Minnesota as a crop consultant up there that knows your agronomy program or whatever. And you're going to interact with farmers. We don't deal directly with farmers. They wear us out, okay? We deal with the service providers to the farmers. So we get paid on a per acre basis, 
and for every time an order is placed, which beats the heck out of what we used to do, which was selling software, the shrink wrap software, a copy at a time. Uh -huh. And you're doing, again, what your competition is not doing. And we're doing it better. And you're doing it better. So they do business models, you're not great. So Chris. <clears throat> We always say we like to do the hard stuff. We want to do the things that other people don't do. Yes. Somebody, like most people in manufacturing do the cookie cutter. We're doing one of a kind cookies. Uh, that we don't take a basswood shutter and make it look like cherry. We make cherry wood shutter. We make reclaimed barn wood from North Carolina, wormy chestnut shutters. And we do have our core basic things that we do maple and oak, that kind of thing. But what oftentimes gives us that chance is the fact that we'll do the things that other people don't want to do. We'll custom match the finish. They send us a cabinet door from their home. We match the stain. You know, instead of that, you got to pick one of the my 16 offerings. You know, we'll, we'll make it right what you want it to be. Okay. So how about this? We just heard that technology. The technologies, for example, that your company offers two, three years, it'll be obsolete. So do you need a portfolio of, um, of advantages, of single advantages to keep going? Or do you have more than one that you, um, that you use? Are you constantly developing something in the background? How, do you, how, how does that work? For us, we are constantly developing new, uh, we call them applications, new, um, new modules or new capabilities that may be crop planning maybe um, I mean we, we, we're constantly trying to to push it forward and satisfy the demand that's out there in our in our clientele mm -hmm. sometimes we have sessions with our with our clients with our larger clients and and and, and just ask them what it is what are they trying to do it requires us to be very much in touch with what our our clients are attempting to do with, with this data, what kind of information is important to them, and to try to stay ahead of them. So it's constantly, we're constantly developing new applications. And our, and our I mean, that's that's why we hire new programmers, is because, I and mean, we're growing, we're growing quite rapidly right now in terms of our development, and it's not because we're, I mean, we, we, we maintain and continue to tweak our core technology, mm -hmm. But most of most of our growth is to expand out what you can do with this site-specific data. What kind of information products can actually be generated? So, people, how do you do? Was a, what do you do? I mean, you're your service. What do you? What's your portfolio? So, so, at the end of the day, we do the same thing that thousands of other companies do. And the way we try and differentiate ourselves is we don't. We we. We're dealing with the customer side and even the employee side. We don't focus on profit. We don't focus on revenue. We just talk about going there, be smart, talk about trying to be as vendor um, agnostic as possible. I mean, we do have our biases, but go in there and, and, and show them that you are the expert in whatever area they want to focus on. So maybe they want to talk about virtual, excuse me, virtualization or database technology or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. We just go in there and we'll be the smart person in the room and advise them on what we think uh, is the way to go. And what happens is, as technology changes, um, you know, we're always we're always on the lookout for new technology. So, as new technologies come out, we're playing with them, we're learning them, we're implementing them across, across hundreds of sites. Uh, so it's very easy for us to go into somewhere like, let's say, um, you know, you take an IT person in an OSU department. If they want to roll out virtualization or in a, in a large storage network. For that person, it's going to be a one-time project, and they might do it once every three or four years. Mm -hmm. For us, we've done it across hundreds of sites, so we can come in and advise them on what needs to be done. Uh, and then they're just happy to just reroute the purchasing through us and the, and the service offering through us. So our, our technique is just, or our, our style is just, um, I mean, it's really, it's pretty simple. It's just um, know what you're offering, know what you're selling. And, uh, and just go in and try and help people out. Don't focus on, well, this product's going to make me more margin than this one. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we are not more profitable than our competition. Um, our competition is probably much more profitable than us because that's what their focus is on. Our focus is, is on we love technology, we love helping people out, um, and whatever comes of that comes of that. And it works out in our favor. So 
we people see our passion, they tell their friends. Um, at the end of the day, I think one thing that's that's a little unique about our organization is we actually only have one person who does sales. Uh, we have one person on payroll who does sales and earns any sort of commission. Everyone else is is for the most part is technical in nature, and they're 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 just to implement. Um, Ninety nine percent of our business is word of mouth or strong partners like Dell or other big vendors who call us to say, we've got a customer, they need your help, will you go take care of them? Chris, the good advantage that keeps you in the game at the over period of time? Is well, it just we, we too are trying to look for different opportunities, obviously. Shutters are not the buzz they were in the early 90s. Uh, and there are more people offering a product. I mentioned that we're, we're looking at motorized. Uh, when we finalize the motorized, concept we want to go one step further with the technology uh, which is really readily available we want it to be uh, solar powered and I, I have the idea that what really needs to happen is that the louvers and the shutter need to open and close based upon heat loss and heat gain in the house based upon the season in the summer when it's hot close in the winter when it's cold but the, but the sun's at the right angle to warm the house open you know, this can go a long way toward, and, and if that can be made to work on a shutter, work on other window treatments, why not to uh, make very energy friendly? So, so I'm hearing technology rise to the top of the thing that keeps you, keeps that advantage high. Is it, is it only technology? No. You know guys for, for us, and, and our, our it's, it's not the technology for us. Mm -hmm. as much as it is the people that we have assembled over 16 years, many of them who have been with us for, we've got 20 some people who have been there over 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's that intellectual capital, interdisciplinary I would say, intellectual capital that is the most important thing to our business. Mm -hmm. It's because, as I just got through saying, we're, the, the way that we grow our company not only is to, is to get more acres, okay, that's one way, but to do more with data so you can get paid on doing more things. And that gets created for us by people who know the system and know what to do mm -hmm. and can work together in teams and, 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 and work in this interdisciplinary environment. But, so us, I mean, technology is, I mean, of course, technology is basic to what we do, mm -hmm. but. But the reason that we're doing what we're doing is because we've got more a, a, a larger group, core of people that know how to do it than in, than our comp, than our competitors are able to assemble. So making, I mean, oh no, no, it makes great sense. And we technology for you. Well, so so you know we have a very uh, hippie mentality in our company. I mean, so for us, what drives our decisions are well, what's fun, you know, so iPad comes out and it's sort of the flavor of the year and every you know everyone wants to talk about apps for them and all these business will, businesses want to talk about building an app for the iPad and you know for us we go well you know this looks cool let's get into it and we get into it and, and um, you know something like the iPad is pretty mainstream we have a lot of people who start asking us about it and we go oh well, you know well, we've got a development team and they can do iPad development for you mm -hmm. so um, you know for us it's just about um, you know, what we focus on is finding people who are very passionate about technology. So whether they're a programmer or a networking person or whatever they may be, we want them to be passionate because whatever is the flavor of the month, uh, whether it be today or a year from now or two years from now, they're going to want to be a part of that. And businesses are going to come to us saying, well, we heard about this. What can you tell us about it? What can you do for us? Um, you know, I think business intelligence is going to be um, a hot topic for the next for, for quite a while and with that comes big data comes big database systems comes new and improved um, technologies that are coming out the people in our office like playing with this stuff not because they get paid to do it it's just what they like doing and so we uh, we, we make sure to find those people so that when we get the call from one of these big companies saying, hey, we need someone who's an expert in this, we go, well, okay, we, we got the person, they're right here. Okay. Um, so for us, the, the technology just, we, we try and marry the passion 
with the people who have the soft skills, the passion, and the customer service and the communication uh, all into one. So yeah, so we didn't expect to hear technology when we talk of wooden shutters. Is that what's moving you and keeping you up here? Well, I wouldn't say it's moving it, but it certainly contributes. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't. We probably use technology less than most people in, a, in an operation of our size, but nevertheless. Uh, when somebody first told me about this World Wide Web, I thought, well, what good is it going to do us? And I agreed to let a gentleman that worked there put us on the web, and the next thing you know, people are calling us from Kentucky and Minnesota. <laughs> I was kind of impressed. So, uh, but, you know, we, we use technology for some of our factory type processes, uh, and we'll continue to obviously explore and move more in that direction as well. So do you, uh, so do you look around at the world, your competitors, and tailor your tailor your your operations, tailor your, your your tailor your advantage to keep you where it's at. Are you constantly positioning yourself? Do you look at your value, your, your value prop, and change things? How, do you, how does that work? I mean, the things changing so much. Are you are you, are you or, this is about under your core competencies and what's happening there? But how do you how do you do this constant positioning to keep yourself here to stay sustainable? You've been around for a while. You know, what do you do? Um, in our case, I would say that we don't, we really don't pay that much attention to our competition, mm -hmm. okay? So it's certainly not driven by that. Not to say that, that, that our competitors don't ever have ideas that sound good to us and we try to emulate, I suppose that happens some, but our primary driver for, for, uh, being current and being, uh, valuable to our clientele involves us spending time with them trying to understand what it is that that they want to do they have wonderful ideas and, and can can tell us can tell us what it is that 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 they want and that that drives us that's it so it is the value proposition it's it's our quest to become more and more important to our clients and to sink our tentacles into their business deeper and deeper as the time goes on, make it that much harder for them to ever leave us if they were ever so inclined. If you spend all of your time thinking about what your competition is doing, you forget who you are. You're kind of like the kid in school that wants to be everybody to like him, and you're worried about what everybody thinks all the time. Be yourself. Uh, enjoy what you do. Have fun. Be passionate about it, as you mentioned. My daughter, who works in my business, uh, has for nine years, uh, said something one day to another individual that maybe I was losing my edge. Well, you know, I've done this 25 years. But you know what's funny? When I'm around some people, it's easy for them to maybe think that. But when I'm in front of a customer, I'm, I'm on center stage. I'm happiest. So when somebody comes to see us, I show them through the shop. I show them how we make a shutter. Nine out of ten of them buy, you know, and I'm trying to, we're putting together a video with the entrepreneur program here right now Excellent. so that we can put that on the web so somebody that thinks they want our shutters in South Carolina after they see how we make them, they'll know they want okay. And I think we have to always try to keep that enthusiasm and let it burn, let people see it. I, you know, and I think that analogy is great. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all small companies, so, you know, Verizon needs to look at what at and is doing, what Sprint's doing. But I think it, at, at, the, at the small business level, I just don't really care what the competition's doing. I mean, that's not to say we don't ever look. I mean, we look more out of curiosity rather than um, rather than coming up with a strategy to compete with. And I think the analogy of saying, you know, it's like you're back in high school or, or whatever and you're worried about what everyone else is saying about you. It just, it just is irrelevant. I mean, you, you be yourself. You worry about you know putting out a great product or service, and, and people are attracted to that. I mean, if they can come in and hear the owner speak about the shutters and why the shutters are great, that goes a long way. Uh, and it's the same it's the same with our service offering. We can go in and talk about hey, here are all the great things we can do, and here's why we think we're you know just get into the detail. People people sense that passion, and they go, this is this is who I want to be associated with. Before I turn it over, but then I'll turn over some questions from the, the inside of the business. Inside the business, with all this passion, all profit growth, 
Revenues, yes, I'm here, you're growing. Profits, is it still important to you? And is, and is that one of the gauges for you seeing yourself as successful and sustainable? Well, of course. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I mean, we, we uh, in our business, we had a lot of lean years. When we started out, uh, we didn't have any, we weren't, we weren't properly capitalized. We essentially had to cash flow our business, which was pretty tough in those early years because you know we had to we had to develop something and be able to sell it. I mean, someone had to write us a check. Okay, that's how we capitalized. We had to, you know, it wasn't you know go out and get venture capital or you know any of these host of ways that you might that you might put money together. We certainly couldn't borrow it with any of that. So we we had to we had to. We had to build something that provided value that we could we could put out in front of someone and they say yes I need that and here's here's a check okay and uh, and that was that was extremely tough for a lot of years certainly six or seven or eight and we didn't make any money I mean we just survived we were just trying to plow back in to the company and grow it at the rate that would sustain the company, but but always looking ahead to the future. Well, at some point, you get tired of that. At some point, you know, you can't just plow everything you're doing back into the company, and you need to make you need to make some money. You have to in order to, to stay in business. And so, for the last. You know, we've been in business now 17 years, and I'd say for the last 10 or 11, it's become more and more important to to to, to have to have a little net income at the end of the year. Okay, you, 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 you kind of need that. Well, I'm following you. And uh, and so we, what we're doing right now is we have a certain figure in mind that we need to we need to make uh, year in and year out as a minimum. And then anything beyond that, we'll make a decision as to whether we plow back into the company or whether, you know, to, 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 to grow, to, mm -hmm. to try to grow for the future or, um, you know, or, or, or stay within that, that profitability range. Another thing that happened to us in two years, two years ago, we sold 20% of our company to a public company called Raven Industries out of South Dakota, and it was a strategic decision because our clientele uses Raven controllers. About 70% of our customers are Raven customers, and and we we made a deal with them, and they end up on a 20% equity partner. Well, now that a public company, even though they have no control, they're still on the board, and they they you know we're always looking at financials. And trust me, a public company is always trying to make money. All right, so we got some pressure associated with, with that investment that we've got to that we've got to perform on. So I like to take a stab at that question. I mean, you know, I, I get asked that all the time, you know, about profitability of revenue. We're always getting calls saying, you're interested in selling your company, we have people who are interested in buying. Um, so again I go back to I mean if people start businesses for different reasons and money is some factor in there, whether it be at the top of the list or you know fifth on the list. I mean, for me, I started the business because I love what I do, and it just happened to be, how do I take my passion and find a way to monetize it? So this is the analogy I use in the business. To me, this is a game. The business is a game. You have to, in any game, you have to have a way to keep a score. And so the score is, for us, is, is a combination of revenue and profitability. We don't want to add five more people onto our staff if our profitability is going to go down or our revenue might go down. Now profitability is obviously at the end of the day more important. But we just don't set a lot of measures against those things. I will say if they're going the wrong way, we're going to go, we're doing so we're playing this game wrong. We are not doing well. We need to change it up. So um, the money is is important, but I, I I tend to think, I mean, I have no data to back this up, I think people that are more focused on the money are more likely to not enjoy it because their heart is in the wrong place. Now everyone, I think, there is a reality of money. You have to have a certain amount of income coming in to support whatever your lifestyle is. For me, I started the company while I was in college, so all that mattered was could I pay for my apartment 
and could I pay for a box of ramen noodles to, to eat, you know, for the week? And other than that, um, whatever. Wow. You know, in a, in, a, in a company that builds a product that's a lot more capital intense, you have to sink a lot of money into it and then hope you get that return. Yeah, see, like, like in our company, you know, we, we may have hire five more developers, and our net income goes down for two or three years as a result of that because it takes them that long to build the new whatever it is that we're trying to build that makes our product offering more attractive. Yes. You know, it's an investment in the future and it's a way to, it's a way to leverage what we have and, and build new applications on that platform yes. for delivery to our clientele. But um, in, in the short term, it costs next year's profitability if you do too much of that, you know? Like David said, uh, when you first start out, you as a small business, if your budget's is ramen noodle based, it gets a little easier. Having a couple of children, uh, <laughs> same situation. Somebody asked me once about it, so what do you think about being a business for yourself? And I said, well, I'm working harder and making less money than I ever dreamed possible. <laughs> okay? And I would tell you that I think for many people in a small business, you, you should think along those lines because it, you're not going to make six figures the first year unless you get real lucky. All right? You're going to work hard. But the bottom line is, you know, profit's got to be there. You won't survive. Downturns, changes have affected us pretty significantly the last few years. I chose to buy my partner out five years ago. Well, I wish I had bought him out ten years ago. Then by now, things would be fine. So what, you know, as a result, I'm working a little harder than I used to. But it's okay. Hard work really never hurt anybody. I'm not physically having to buck boards and, you know, move things around. But, uh, you know, you, you stay focused. Keep enjoying what you do. One. Well, we have some questions from the um, students. So, so with Victor, sure. Just following up on the recent conversation, besides profitability, what are some of the descriptors or criteria, set of criteria you use to determine competitive advantage um, service versus product businesses, besides profitability? So what, so besides profitability, what else do we consider as a competitive advantage? Is that what yes. you, do you determine, do you determine as a competitive advantage? Yes, determine as a competitive advantage for, for product versus service businesses. Or well, yeah, I, I don't know if I know how to answer that question. I mean, for, for us, we do services, so at the end of the day, I, you know, people are in business for different reasons, and, and I, I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on, you know, you get a business and you grow it, grow it, grow it, and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and I don't think that's necessarily the right approach in every situation. So for me personally, uh, when it comes to the business, I'm pretty selfish, and I go, what, what do I personally love doing? So, and that determines what um, those criteria are that we will judge everything on. We are not on this on this eternal quest to beat out competition forever and ever and ever. Um, we want to have a uh, a great reputation, so so that is very important to us. Um, we want people to know that if Interworks comes in, whatever they do is going to be fantastic. We want the profitability to um, you know we set certain thresholds for profitability. If, and if, and if, um, we have certain engagements that dip below that threshold. We will ask, well, why did this happen? And how can we do it better? But, but for us, it's not, because we're not just trying to go rule the world, um, I mean, we just, we just look internally and go, well, what, what actually is enjoyable for people? And this is where I go back to, I mean, we're a little more of a, we take this little sort of this hippie philosophy of let's just do things that are fun. And as long as we're making money and people here are happy and we enjoy the people we work with, well, great. Whatever happens, happens. And, and cool things come out of that. I mean, we go, you know what, we're, you know what, let's just make a game just for the hell of it. And we go make a Blackberry game and 2,000 people download it a day and they're from South Africa and Australia and India. And, and, and all of a sudden we monetize it. I mean, we start generating revenue and we're like, okay, well, you know, what else sounds fun? Let's go do it. So um, I, I know that's not 
that's not the common answer, but that's mine. How about you, how about you Jeff? Well, if I understood correctly, a uh, far selling a service, we're selling a product and a service uh, in the sense that, you know, somebody bought shutters from us in 1989 and calls up today and says, there's something wrong with my shutter, we go fix it for free. So we don't have a lot of service because we built it right the first time. But nevertheless, continuing to remember that we've made something that we've told people, if anything goes wrong, we're going to fix it. And we make it right and we take the light and going back. And it's amazing if you go back and fix something that the kid threw a ball through, mm -hmm. we might have to charge for that. If it broke through fatigue, we'll fix it at our expense. And while we're there, we sell a few more shutters while we're at <laughs> Well, you know, in our case, we're, we'd be in that category of product and, and service too. I mean, we've, we've moved more and more into the service side, but, um, you know, we're still, as we, as we build these new applications, they're essentially like, like products or new capabilities that, that our clientele can access. And, you know, one thing that I, that I, uh, I want to be sure and clarify is Bayfar and, and Chris, you know, you're, you've both expressed this, this love of what you're doing and the passion for it. And I don't know that I've properly conveyed that, but that's a driver for me as well. I mean, that's, it, it, was a, it was a vision many years ago of incorporating these techniques into agriculture as a, I mean, you guys probably think I'm crazy, but that really turns me on, that whole concept of being able to do that. It's, a, that it's, it's like new agriculture. It's like a better way of doing business. It's like, it's like why, would you put, why would you put a straight rate of fertilizer on a field when over here it doesn't need any and over here it needs a whole bunch? You know, why would you do that when you have a way to, 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 to put the right amounts on in every place in the field? And, and so, and so the, the, the development of products or, or services that satisfy that, that inner feeling of accomplishment and, and, as corny as it sounds, contributing to the welfare of agriculture is extremely important to me and a much, much bigger driver than competitive advantage, okay? I figure that if you get those things done, like like, like I'm describing, you, you get that value proposition, to put it in textbook terms here, satisfied, and you get uh, more and more of these applications built to satisfy more and more people, your competition problem goes away if you do, it, if you do a good job. You know, they're always trying to catch up with you instead of you worrying about what they're doing. Oh, I, th I think, you know, just to say one, one more thing about your question, I think you have to look at the motivation uh, and, and what drives a company. So I think one of the things I really get to, I, I love business. I mean, I love business case studies. I love you know anything related to business and anything related to technology. I mean, one of the things I really like is we get to go into all these businesses, meet with senior management or owners, and see how they run their business. We work with a lot of capital companies. So when a capital company goes and buys out another company, I mean, their goal is to grow it and, and uh, increase profitability and, and then go, you know, possibly turn around and flip it and sell it and make more money. Um, very different from what, what probably all uh, our goals are. Um, so so the, the driving factors in my business are um, doing what I love, monetizing on it. Um, the driving factor of a publicly traded company is going to be much different. Right? Uh, the CEO of, of Verizon can't say, well, I love what I do. As long as everyone here is happy, that's good. I mean, the investors are going crazy. <laughs> the investors want uh, their investment to increase in value. Right. So. Yes. Um, remaining succinct, I'm going to and that takes a lot of looking at competitors and staying on top of like innovation and stuff. Do you, has there ever been a morally gray area that you've been in while doing research for competitors and stuff, and how would you deal with that? Well, I, you know, I'd say for us, we sell um, we sell other people's products, so we don't build our own. Um, and and it, it, you know, 
when you talk about Dell and EMC and all these big companies, they, if we're going and selling a $200,000 solution, there's a lot of people getting compensated at different levels if we go and make that sale happen. So for us, I mean, one thing we run into a lot is people try and throw the monetary incentives out there. They'll say, you sell our product and we're going to give you this much margin. Or you sell, and that, there's nothing, I guess, fundamentally morally wrong with that. But for us, um, we just made the decision that we want to sell what we think is the best solution, not necessarily what makes us the most money. And that's why I made the comment earlier. Uh, there, a lot of our competition makes more money than we do. Not because they're immoral or anything like that, but because they <coughs> choose to push solutions that have higher margins that will contribute to their bottom line and their profitability uh, greater than solution B. Well, for us, we go, solution B is a better solution. We're going to sell it. Uh, so yeah, that, I mean, that stuff comes up a lot. Producer? Well, that all goes back to who you are as a person. Uh, if you know, somebody said uh, to you, would, would you take this bag from me down the road and give it to a friend, would you say, okay, so, well, would you do it for $10,000 knowing that you could get arrested along the way? Well, no. You know, and really, what you are as a person, who you are, what you think, what you value, that should, that should come through in your business every day. Uh, the way you treat people, the way you work with your employees, the way you handle your customers. And, you know, working with employees in, in this day and age, it, it's a challenge to help them be their best. And they have lots of problems. And you're supposed to fix all the ones that they can't fix. And you get some of that. But, you know, you're, what drives me is lots of times trying to help the people within the business make good life decisions, uh, contribute to the company, and help their own family as they help themselves. But, you know, really, your morals will, will help you in your business decisions because you don't do things just for money. Yeah. You know, as I'm sitting here contemplating an answer for you in our business, I, I've got to tell you, we, we just don't have any, I just, we're just not confronted with that, the way we operate or in our industry or, um, so I, I just, I just can't really, I, I just don't think it's, it's a problem at all for us. Thank goodness. Now, having said that, you remember at the very beginning I told you that I farmed for 10 years up in Kansas, which I did. But the last two years of that, I've gotten involved in the oil and gas business kind of on the side. And got into this, this thing where we're hauling fresh water to drilling rigs because they couldn't find groundwater to drill, drill with. And there was a big oil play up there. And I found out very early on that the only way that you could get the contract with that drilling rig was to pay the tool pusher. I mean, I'm not saying every instance, but that was just the common practice. And if you're going to play that game, you're going to you're going to be faced with a moral dilemma, okay? Which I was, and and so that that was never core to my life or my business or anything else. That little two-year stint, but what it did is it showed me how a lot of business is done in the real world and the kind of things that you can run into. And I thank my lucky stars that in the environment and the industry that we're dealing in, I can't even think of a decent example of any moral gray area or anything else that I'm being confronted with and, and have been. I actually have a really good example. Um, there, we, you know, we sell a lot of storage, and those are high margin, big ticket items. I mean, one sale is easily, can easily be over $100,000. We had a, a customer that we've worked with for a long time. Um, took our, our demo equipment out there, had it set up in his environment, let him play around with it, and he was very happy, ready to purchase, and on the day of the purchase, uh, we find out he's talking to a competitor. And after we start digging into it a little more, we found out the competitor's taking him to, uh, you know, fun places that, that uh, a single guy might go, you know, <laughs> at night. And, uh, <laughs> And so all this is unfolding, and I call him up and I go, you know, I say, what's going on? We, we've been talking to you for weeks. You've been really happy. Why? And he, and he point blank said to me, you know, and he, and he said it laughing like it was a joke, and he didn't know I knew 
the, the other side of the story. He said, you know, if you guys would just do, you know, this for me, and he sort of spelled it out, then maybe we could do business together. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that's not the kind of person we want to be involved with. Um, and, and, you know, the, I think the question becomes, where do you draw the line? I, we had, a, there was a huge company that we were talking to, and I'd go see this lady every single day. There was a client right, a client site right next to her, so when I was there, I'd go see her and drop in and say, hey, so when are we gonna do business together? And after, after about the sixth visit, she said, you know, if you would just bring me cappuccinos when you came to see me, we could probably get started. And I said, okay, you know, next time I come, I'll bring you a drink. And I just left, and I, I never went back, because I thought, you know, she's basically saying, you bring me something, and then I'll give you something back. And I thought, you know, that's not, that is not the business we want to be. I want to bring her a cappuccino because she works with us and we like her and we think she's great, not because I have to do it to win her business. And because of the intention, you know, we just sort of drew a line there and said, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, you know, the gray area for us is, is things like, Oklahoma City Thunder makes the playoffs and we have access to a corporate suite and floor tickets and do we buy those tickets and invite the CIOs to come to it? I mean, for, the, for us that's a great area because at the end of the day, how much different is that than taking them to a, a club at night or taking them to Catholic Yeah, Jesus? but I think it's different. Well, it is, it is different. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, it's, it's different. We, I'm we, just saying. We have a suite at Blue Tickets <laughs> and I am proud. To say sure. that we take clients sure. to that, and that's sure. one of the reasons no, we can justify even having it. And we're not doing it to buy their business or or anything like that. It's like it's like appreciation. It's like that's right. That's right. right. You I'm guys have done a bunch of you, you. You've been wonderful customers, and and come on, let's have a big old right. party at Moon Pickens. That's what we're doing, and beat your ass right. while we're there. <laughs> 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 what I'm saying is there is a gray area, and I'm not talking about. Existing customers look at potential customers. Yeah. So yeah. I'm saying, I'm saying potential. Look, at the end of the day, I mean, it's a philosophical issue. At the end of the day, you can take them to a suite or you can just hand them $100 in cash. You know, they're, they're, they have the same base value, let's say. Actually, the suite's a lot more. So everyone draws a line in different places. Everyone's greater is in a different spot. And so we do deal with, we do have those issues and we do have open discussions in the office about it. And, you know, there's some that are just black and white. Yeah, one, one example, and this happened real early to me, and I didn't really handle it as well as I should have. The gentleman uh, wanted me to charge, uh, not charge him sales tax because he was going to buy it through his business, and I, I think he owned a liquor store, you know, couldn't make a connection. And he said, well, why won't you take this? And, and I said, well, you know, if I cheat the government, I'd cheat you, wouldn't I? Well, that didn't really go over real well. Uh, he did buy the product. But then he made it a point to be more than difficult to work with, uh, and even told my installer later, "Your boss made me mad." Well, I, and I guess I did. I probably should have just said, "No, I can't do that." I've become a little more tactful with age. Uh, but, you know, to me, that's a moral issue. Am I going to? Could could I accept a retail liquor store tax number and run it through and maybe get away with it? Possibly. You know, but the, you know what the state of Oklahoma says: you need to charge tax. I'm charging tax. And I'd argue the other side of that and I'd go, well, actually we would we would actually sell in that situation because that owner is obligated to file for use tax or you know property tax or whatever it may be. Somehow they're supposed to pay that tax. And uh, even though we know they're probably gaming it in our case we wouldn't say we're we're gonna we're not gonna make that decision. Wow. Yeah, so the lines, I mean, it's, it's just based on, I think, uh, I don't think one's wrong and one's right. I mean, there's some that are just so clear, but, but uh, you can justify different situations. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on the relationship between company culture and the business model? Extremely important to tie those two together. I consider it to be um, one of the top priorities of our company is to maintain the culture 
that we have worked so hard to establish over a whole lot of years. And when that culture is maintained and the staff is happy and motivated and proud to be a part of it and working with friends and, and trusted colleagues, then you get sustainability from that. It's, in our case, as I said before, our intellectual capital is key to what it is we're trying to do. That, that is the single thing that makes us capable of building that next application, okay? Or whatever that upgrade or improvement needs to be to keep us on the cutting edge and state of the art. And, and so corporate culture is tied in with employee welfare and happiness and, and pride and, and desire to build the best technology in the industry. It's, it's all together for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think company cultures, I, to me, it's everything. I mean, it, if we did not have the culture we did or if there was something that came and caused a, a rough change for the worse, um, you know, there's so many people in our office who can easily leave, find another job, and make a lot more money going and working for a big, huge company. And they just don't want to because they really love the office dynamic. And I'd say in, uh, unless, the, unless it's a business that's in a unique niche or, or has um, some sort of a competitive advantage, it's going to be very difficult for others to touch. I just think culture is extremely important. You know, one of the things I see in, in working with all these different businesses is, for example, you know, I'll go into some businesses where there's, there's people who whine and complain a lot. And that stuff is just contagious. And then I go out there three weeks later and the entire office is doing it. And it just crushes the business. And that's just one you know, sort of example of how uh, what the culture's like can affect productivity. And, okay. and through the years, we've seen our, you know, that environment go from good to bad and bad to good, and back and forth a few times. And I wouldn't say bad, but maybe not as good as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So I, I've tried to make it a point to always help that culture along. I, once a week at least, I'm at the time clock when everybody leaves, tell them thank you for being here. We appreciate your work. You know, I hand them their paycheck still because I want to say thank you. You were here. We needed you. We value what you did. And, and people oftentimes today forget the human element of things, but you want to be treated well. Every employee you'll ever own, every coworker you'll ever have, they want to be treated on an equal level with you. And never forget that. Um, we've been taught to do an extensive amount of market research prior to starting the business, but now since uh, markets are changing so quickly, and in order to stay com competitive, how important is it for your company to continually collect market research and evaluate and adjust your value proposition? Well, in, in our case, we don't think of it as market research. We would never use that term. Um, we spend absolutely no time doing so-called research. However, what you're describing is what we're getting to when we go to our clients and ask them to tell us what they're trying to do. That's, that's really market research. That, that's the way, the only way I would know about doing it in our particular industry. So I think what you're asking, when you first say that, I'm thinking, ah, we don't do that. Well, we do do it, but we do it in, a, in an informal, in an informal way, but that's, that's, that's how we know what we need to do. Well, let's say with the dealers that we have that buy and resell our product, we talk to them because Again, market research from the standpoint of, you, know, you can pull up all kinds of statistics today off the web. And there's, there's this many people that live in this expensive of a home that have this much income, and they'll buy this much. That never has meant a whole lot to me uh, because bottom line is if our product doesn't get in front of them by somebody that appreciates it, it won't make a whole lot of difference. But 
I, I think again, work with the people. You know, last year we did a deal where we just sent it a, a, a piece of mail, literature, telling everybody that had bought from us for the last 20 years, we appreciated your business, we'd like to work for you again. Boom, best month of sales of the year. You know, just go back to customers that have already bought from you and, and find out what do you want, what do you need, and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and then while you're there, ask them, what are you looking for different? What do you, what do you need today? We've sold people shutters one time, went back to their house the next time, and then we did solar shades. Now, now I, I want to be, before Bayfar, I, I want to be clear that I'm answering the question as our, as representing our company and the way we do things, but I'm sure that market research is a very valuable thing for a lot of differently positioned companies out there, so I don't mean to throw cold water on the notion of that as a, as a formal process. And, and so I'd agree with him. I think, um, you know, he said, well, we don't use the word market research. So at our office, we don't use the word market research. But in all reality, again, this ties back to the passion. You know, if, an I, if the new iPad's coming out, we've got it on day one. New iPhone's coming out, we've got it. Amazon, the Kindle Fire's coming out, we've got it pre-ordered. New storage network's coming out, we've got it. You know, I mean, we, for us, we're getting it because we want to see it. Uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, that is market research. So we, we try and, um, we're always looking at, at, at things out there because we want to see it and experience it for ourselves. And then when we like it, we'll go <coughs> apply it to um, what our clients want. We are, not, we are not pushing the cutting edge technology. It just came out today, let's put it in tomorrow. The stuff that we do, it's been out long enough to at least have a decent base, and we can have other people validating that, that it is a good solution. So, um, yeah, I mean, market research for us is sort of, I mean, it's like a kid in the sandbox. I mean, for us, we just go, well, let's go play with this stuff and go, oh, it's cool, you know, let's, then let's tell the people about it. More. Um, do you have intellectual property protected in your company? And if so, um, does this help with your competitive advantage? Well, in our case, we made a decision many years ago and have reaffirmed it many times that we're not going to patent anything. And, and, and I read the the materials that were sent prior to this class and, 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 and familiar with uh, some of the ideas about the value of patents, and which I'm sure are right on for certain kinds of products, whatever. In our case, we, and, and we protect with copyrights, trademarks, those kinds of things. I mean, we don't want somebody using our name or our logos or, or trying to to uh, you know, represent that anything that, that we've accomplished, you know, that, that, that belongs to them. Okay, we're 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 certainly diligent about that. But but as far as protection, and I want to use the patent as as the example here. We we made the decision not to pursue that because in in our case we feel like that what we're doing is sufficiently complex with so many moving parts I used the term interdisciplinary before we've put together a unique I mean by far wouldn't you agree I mean you've been out to our place we've got we've got we've got folks we've got 50 people 50 over 50 people working together that are coming from such diverse backgrounds like plant and soil science to, to to accounting, to marketing, to ge geography, the GIS side of that, to ag engineering, electrical computing engineering, computer science. It's this team of people working together, building solutions that we hope are so hard to replicate. And they really, and when you're writing code, as long as you protect that code and make sure nobody ever gets access to that, which we do, I don't know how they can look at something that we're doing and, and just go copy it or whatever. So we made the decision to dispense with all the worry about all that and just get it done and keep moving fast. If somebody's trying to, to 
right up our tailpipe, they better get to running or we're going to be way ahead of them. How about your crew? No intellectual property with our business. We had an opportunity to patent that motorized shutter concept. The cost right. to get it is one thing. The cost to defend it is right. 10 times greater. It's not worth it right. for, for what we do. Yeah. Um, you know, just, what is it? It said be first or be best in business. Well, we weren't really the first. and But we think we're the best at what we do. But And that's, you know, I think that's probably the best solution for us as far as people don't want to do what we do. What do you mean you're going to make four hickory shutters for one guy? <laughs> that's what he wants. <laughs> and I, that's it. For us, it's just not applicable. We, we trademark our name. It's a hell of a long process just to get a little TM by our name, <laughs> uh, which we'll, you know, we probably never have to defend it, but one day we might. Um, I, I'll tell you, we spent tens of thousands of dollars. We went to trademark our name. There's a company called IntroWorks. We're InterWorks. They don't, they're not in the same line of business, but the U.S. Patent Office decided it was close enough, so we had to go through this elaborate process. We, we try and avoid attorneys as much as possible. We don't have to should have used your last name like I did. Yeah, so. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, mostly not out. Uh, we hit on it here and there, uh, but to elaborate on it uh, in a sustainability aspect, how do you view the retaining of your customers and how do you invest in, in that relationship? And in hindsight, can you elaborate more on possibly a competitive advantage that has come from that? So, so, you know, for us, um, that's actually really important for us because a lot of, you know, 95% of our business is repeat in some manner. So the same clients we had when I lived in Maple 400 behind Eskimo Joe's are still clients today. I, we first worked with SSD in 1996 and they're still, uh, I, I wasn't even of drinking age. You know, well, back then we worked and it was hundreds of dollars and now it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so that, that's pretty neat, isn't it? Great. So, so for us, it's, um, and, and I mean, frankly, this is an area where we've done well. We've done, you know, we've had cycles where we've done very poorly. Uh, Kurt, you know, Shutters is a good example. They were actually a client, and then we lost them as a client, and then we got them back as a client. And it was because we, you know, we were getting too busy to maintain relationships and keep our eye on the ball and lost focus. So for us, a lot of it is just about staying in touch, communicating. I mean, it's everything you learn in fifth grade, but everyone just sort of forgets um, when, when they get into business. I mean, we just needed to stay in touch, communicate, do, do a great job, find out what the needs are, and fulfill them when we could. Uh, for us, it is very a very important part of the business. I mean, at, at any given time, we have several hundred active clients. Uh, we're, not, we're not marketing to the world, we're trying to um, stay focused and, and, and uh, just slowly grow and add to that client base. So, so if, if we if we lost that, we would die. As a business. So, well, yeah, I second what they are saying as far as you know, staying in touch with with clients and, and all that. Very, very, very important. In our particular case, we have another advantage that I recognize and I'm very grateful to have. And that is, we are, we are essentially managing a database for people, for our clients. And, it, and after you do that a few years and it continues to grow, it becomes harder and harder for those clients to leave and do something else. It becomes part of their systems. They tie their accounting systems to them. They train their personnel, which in some instances are into the hundreds, like Monsanto or Helena Chemical Company or Gromar, which is the largest regional cooperative in the U.S. And, and so the sustainable advantage that we enjoy has to do with the fact that we've been working with these guys for so long that we're so entrenched in, in, in their business 
and their, their databases that they'd rather cut their right arm off than they would to leave us. Okay? Because it'd be painful and it'd be very expensive. And their legacy data um, and their, their historical information is going to be structured in a different way. Now, another thing that we do in our company, and I've tried not to get into a bunch of the details, the technical end of this. That's, I don't think that's appropriate for this for the setting. But I have to say that we, we structured a standardized database starting in 1999 and have perfected that over these 12 years now such that that database is, is defined, the elements of that database are defined, and, and it exists in a certain uh, database structure, okay? So with the nomenclature all standardized, you know, what somebody calls a, a corn hybrid is going to be, you know, the elements that you can enter data about a corn hybrid are set, and all of the pick, all of the data that's possible to populate that database with are coming off standardized pick lists, okay, that gets updated constantly. And so that becomes a tremendous sustainable advantage if anything else comes along that's different than that standardized database because it won't fit in there. You know, it's a mess. So, you know, I recognize that as a sustainable advantage that may be a little bit unusual, but in our case, it's very, very key. We've kind of talked about this quite a bit tonight, but basically exceed customer expectations. You know, the, the more you, you just make it so good that I don't want to go anywhere else because nobody does it as well as these guys. That's the way to, that's the way to me that you're going to be most successful. Just exceed. Um, in terms of sustainable advantage that is the topic of the night I guess uh, when and to what degree would you say time or timing has been the essence or, or greatest contributing factor of your success well I'd love to answer that <laughs> because in our case if we had started early like real real early I said I said we started too early and couldn't make a living but you take that away and, and wait 10 years to start so when you can make a living, we don't ever get the toehold and the foothold that lets us have a place in the market. I, I would hate to have to compete with us today for that very reason. The timing is, 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 is crucial. It, it's a whole lot harder to start at the bottom when things are simple and and there's not that many people doing whatever it is you're doing and grow and grow with them than it is to wait till the horse is already out of the barn and then try to you know try to come in there and compete with something that's become established over over a several year period tremendous so, advantage so to be early there's two examples uh at intervals that come to mind so the first one is um, we've always been dealt fans so if someone says I want HP we say well that's fine it's a good it's a good product at the end of the day they use the same things on the inside but here's why we like Dell if you want to go with HP that's fine we'll support it no problem we've done that for years and years and years and Dell has always been a direct company they uh, they do not they were not a partner channel friendly uh, uh, vendor so over the years that started evolving and um, as it evolved we started to stand out more and more and more because we were always sort of tooting the, you know, the Dell horn. And um, what happened was once they decided to sort of open the floodgates up and really handpick partners and decide who are we going to work closely with, we were at the top of their list. So there's all sorts of VIP benefits that we get to um, enjoy today that other people, it's going to be very hard for them to ever get in. So. Dell handpicked us to say, you know what, when we have Dell service opportunities in Oklahoma, InnerWorks will do it. So I may literally wake up one morning, have an email on my phone that says, hey, we've got a $250,000 opportunity, do you guys want it? And I just, you know, it's yes or no. <laughs> if we say yes, then we go and we, and they just handed us this thing on the plate. Now other people are aware of it and they're going, well, we want that. And, you know, Dell's sort of shut the doors. 
And so that's, that's one way that timing over many years of being persistent ultimately paid off. One other example is, you know, we, we do a lot of business intelligence and data analytics work. These are not things we did. Um, these are not things we did several years ago. There was a product that came out called Tableau. We loved the product, thought it was uh, the greatest thing ever. We were using it every day. We wanted to try and build up part of the business to support that product. And for probably 14 months, we did absolutely zero dollars in revenue with the thing. Our approach to trying to sell the solution was wrong. The way we were talking to people was wrong. Everyone was really excited about what we had to say, but nothing would happen. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with uh, the market. People were just not ready to talk about cheap solutions to deal with big data. It had always been, if you want to deal with big data, you go buy $100,000 plus solutions. So it was a very new concept. People didn't really buy into it. Literally, the week we were debating on just dropping it entirely and giving up on it, um, we got a call from the company and they said, you know, CEO wants to meet with you guys. We fly out there and they say, um, they say, you know, we, we're a product company. You guys are a service company. We're happy to, to make you guys a part of our service team unofficially. And, uh, and, and since then, we went from zero dollars to, to many millions of dollars in under a year uh, in just that space. And so the, literally the world's largest companies are now calling us. We've established a niche for ourselves. They're calling us saying on a Friday saying, can you have someone here Monday We want your help? And they can't even they can't even process the paperwork fast enough to get us out there. And so this business went from, like I said, nothing to, to multi-millions. And uh, part of that had to do with being first. And there are now hundreds and hundreds of big partner, or partners out there, not big partners. But they're just not going to get the same treatment. We've, we've already proven ourselves. We've already established a track record. For anyone else to do that means that the Tableau would have to risk sending work and potentially going wrong when they know we've done right, you know, dozens and dozens of times. So timing was everything uh, in that space. Chris? Uh, well, I'd say with timing, all of us needed to be where we are today. And in 1905, wouldn't have done us a lot of good. So, but at the same time, there are lots of products it doesn't all have to be technology driven. It doesn't have to be any one particular thing. But the timing does factor into it a little bit, but, but it really goes back to that core principle of, of good service. And I'm waiting on that quarter million dollar phone call that he's talking about for just one account. But, uh, you know, obviously everybody's business is a little different. But uh, I think, again, it's the, the basics are pretty simple. Yeah, I think timing varies for. Uh, for every company. I think the best example of timing done right is Facebook. I mean, <laughs> Facebook is not a complex product. Uh, they, they just had, they did a series of things in the right order at the right time when computers were slowly hitting the masses and now things have just exploded. Twitter's another example. I mean, it, you know, fundamental, I mean, now everyone's like, oh, it's great. And you know, there's some people still say it's stupid. Twitter came out, I thought it was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, but the timing was right. I mean, um, not complex products, and uh, you know, I couldn't really speak to what, how much marketing went into it. I think they're in the right place at the right time, combined with good business. More. Um, Bayfar, you spoke briefly about strategic partners. I was wondering for the other two, um, have either of you utilized strategic partners or alliances and used it as a strategy to give your company a unique advantage? Yes, you know, earlier I mentioned that we sold 20% of our company to a, to a public company. That was strictly about strategic advantage. We figured that by partnering with them, that we would increase our sales by more than 20% by virtue of the fact of, of being affiliated with them and, and our technology tightly integrated with them. And, and I can think of another couple of examples of strategic partnering that have been in 
valuable to us. And I think that it behooves all of us, at least in the technology world, to continue to look for strategic partners and always evaluate uh, those the opportunities that might arise by by getting uh, strategically aligned. How about you, sir? Well, I, I would say that you know, we are all a company still. I still own it all, but I mean, I don't have any partners in the sense of uh, capital investment, other firms, or anything of that nature. But you know, the, the partners again for me go back to the people that buy and resell our product. Uh, a ASAP Blinds in Manasquan, New Jersey, consistently sends me orders. He, he's, he's my strategic partner, one of many like that. And, and again, that just goes back to you know, taking good care of them and uh, you know, continuing to, you know, I call them re all recently and said, what do you see for the, for the winter, the fall, the next spring? What, 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 what are people looking for different? What can we offer you out of the ordinary that we've never offered before? Some of that kind of stuff. I, I think partnerships are very um, underrated. I mean, for us, we have one salesperson. Like, that's it. Uh, most of our sales come from, from everyone in the company understands that, that if there's opportunity, we should discuss it with the, the business owners. But a good chunk of it just comes from people like Dell. Who, uh, and, and, and really, from the start of the business, you know, I said when I started the company, I just went to all these guys that built computers and said, I know you don't want to do the service. You want us to do it for you because we'll do it and it'll help you guys sell more of your product and we'll get what we want. And they said, sure. So on day one, they're like, here you go. There's business. And so we never really had to pursue business. It always just, it literally is almost handed to us on a silver platter. And, uh, and I think, why, why don't more people do that? I mean, I'm like, this is so, it's so obvious. Go make the guys at Dell happy. And they open their books up to you, you know. I mean, we, we, um, you know, we, we already work with SSD. SSD called Dell um, uh, to talk just about a big storage solution. Dell turns around and calls and says, go and get out to SSD. That, 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 I was going to actually mention that, but, I mean, we call Dell. We're, we're buying servers. A lot of them, several hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff, okay. We didn't call Bayfar. We called Dell, all right. They said, enter works. I mean, that's how it worked, right. didn't yeah. it? So, so and, and, and the sale came through through Bayfar's company, which we are already working with in other ways. But I mean, that's exactly how it works. So I mean, he's, I know he's telling the truth so, here. So, he, so, he, so every, everyone wins. The Dell people don't have to set foot out there again, and they're going to get comped because they get their revenue numbers. They end up getting a better price because we can offer them a better price as a partner. And we make money we weren't going to otherwise make. So Plus he can do all the service, right? So and then on top of that, there you know, Dell, Dell is big. Dell cannot just jump out there and slap this thing in and move on. I mean, there's a whole process, and we can go do that. So th this is a model we've duplicated with all kinds of vendors, and so it, it's almost comical what happens now because I mean, you know, it used to be traveling somewhere was like. A, I get all excited, we all making a trip, and you know, this is fun. And now we're like, I mean, we just get calls from vendors like, hey, we'll fly you to Vegas, you want to go to Pebble Beach, you want to do this? And, and they're flying us all over to tell us about their products because they want us to be their partner that, that's working with them so that they can say, here's all this work, please go, please go make it be successful so we can sell more of it. Uh, and it's not just Dell, I mean, it's, it's a half dozen to ten vendors. Yes. In the early days of business, first two years, um, the students hear a lot about the challenge of working in the business versus being able to work on the business. Um, in those first two years, were you really able to think about sustainable competitive advantage, or were you too busy doing what you're doing? Sustain, survive. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. You know, just two kids, rinse, do. You just keep working, get it done. You know, you don't think about anything. I do, you know. 
I think it's completely a function of, of uh, an individual's life situation. For me, I had no, I could have gotten money from my parents if I needed it. Um, I, I, I worked enough at the movie theater and, you know, between other things to pay my, my rent. I mean, I started this at, I guess, probably age 18. Uh, so I just did not have, I did not have mouths to feed. Uh, I didn't have um, big car payments. Like, Rapper at the time, so I mean, it just it, it was it was easy for me because it was it was convenient. I was in school. I found a way to just grow it slowly. There was not some massive amount of time that had to go into building a product that then I had to test the market, you know, see if people would actually buy it or buy it. Uh, for me, I could gradually turn it on, and by the time I graduated, it was I mean, it was there. So. You know, I often wonder, it'd be interesting to see stats on when people start businesses, because in my mind, it seems to be they're either very young or they're sort of at a, at a place in life where they've established enough of a savings to go, you know, I'm tired of working somewhere else, I'm going to go do my own thing. Uh, it, it would definitely have been much more difficult now that I have a, a you know, three-year-old and a big house payment and car payment. You know, I was driven in, in the first two years, the way you framed the question, to try to figure out and develop a software product that somebody would write a check for. And as I've already told you in my in my case, I mean, I had a very, I think you will agree that I had a very unusual pathway to business being on faculty here at this university. And so to me, it wasn't <coughs> money to, to, to live on so much as it was to try to get something that would work so that we could cash flow this business to the point that it could be self-sustaining. But words like sustainable advantage and, and all of that weren't in the vocabulary then because we weren't thinking in those terms. It was, I mean, that, that came later, and that's why we had to change the business model two or three different times in order to try to achieve this sustainability and, uh, and, 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 and the advantage that comes from that. But in, in the early years, for me, it was the challenge of trying to figure out what it is. I mean, it was doing, we did something that had never been done before. And you know, your question about timing, just think about this for timing. T timing is huge for all of us and all, and all, and all these things. What if I'd gone to school the first time like I was supposed to and just knocked the top off, <laughs> all right? I go into an economics program and I'm like a superstar, all right? And get through in 1975, that's how old I am. And what if I'd have done that? Well, I'd have probably done something that would have been good. I hope I would have, but it's dang sure it wouldn't have been this because the timing was such that there was no GPS system until about 1991. And what I'm involved in, if you don't have GPS, just go pack it up and go home, you know? And, and on and on. I mean, what about the Pentium chip and the PC that got released in about 1995? We had to have that happen to even to be able to render a map up on a computer screen. I mean, when we first started doing this, just to, just, just to draw up a simple map would take like 20 <coughs> minutes. I mean, you'd go to have coffee or do whatever you want to do just to have one screen draw up. You couldn't get anything done. So you, therefore, you couldn't, you couldn't sell anything to anybody. It wouldn't write you that check. And so, you know, but, but by the time, but because we started then, and we weren't worrying about sustainable advantage, we're just worrying about let's get something that'll work so somebody writes a check, then, then <coughs> things matured and technology caught up and, and we had the tools and the infrastructure that started to form that would let us do what we're doing. Yeah, you know, I just want to, you know, I kind of say, like, I just breeze through and things sort of happen. I just want to say, like, like, there was really a lot that went into it. And because it was fun, it just sort of flew by. I mean, there are so many little, you know, you talk about being in the, 
business. I mean, I was doing things like figuring out how to open up a commercial checking account. I mean, that's not a that's not a two minute thing. And so, um, you know, it was things like that, and you know, you got to figure out who's going to be your CPA and how are you going to get incorporated. All these things that went into it for me were just sort of just sort of cool. So it didn't really seem like work. And uh, but yeah, the, er the early years were not about. Um, what's this going to look like 10 years from now? I mean, the, the, the vision was, it, it was it was a sliding scale. It was all relative based on the time. It was, ooh, how can, how can we do work for this business that's a really cool business? And that, every year, that what that meant changed. And um, and now when we get to a size where we can, you know, where we can set direction and vision and decide what sort of opportunities we want to pursue, um, you know, here in the latter years, it's been much more important to step away from the day-to-day -day of the business. And, uh, you know, when there's 70 employees, they're sort of turning to you saying, where are we going? What are we doing? And, I, and I've had to try and take myself out of the day-to-day -day as much as possible, which has been hard because I really love actually doing stuff. So. Well, what was this thing so hard? But we actually have some um, your hosts who have will give us some takeaways from what you presented to us. Um, sorry, we forgot to introduce ourselves at the beginning. I'm Jamie Silberg. This is Alex Best. We were just so excited to introduce the speakers, we forgot who we were. Um, so, from Chris Keats, first off, we got there's three things for a sale quality, service, and price, and you've got to pick two. Every customer that's unhappy will tell <coughs> other people, and every happy customer will tell one person. So you better be good to your customers. We like to do the hard things, the stuff that others won't do. What gives us that chance is doing what other people won't do. If you spend all your time worrying about your competition, you'll forget who you are. Who you are. Um, and when talking about being in his own business, he said he was working harder and making less than he ever thought possible. Stay focused and keep enjoying what you do. Who you are as a person should come through your business in what you do every day. And you don't ever do things just for money. Um, I hand employees their paycheck still just to say thank you. Employees want to be treated on your level, so give them that respect. Um, about market research, he says go back to customers that have already bought and ask them what they want. Be first or be best. People don't want to do what we do, so that's how they do their competitive advantage. Exceed customer expectations. Make it so good they don't want to go anywhere else. And for Bay Far, um, at the end of the day, we do what thousands of other customers do. So we go in there and show them we're the expert at whatever they're wanting to do. Know what you're offering, what you're selling, and just show the customer what we've got. We have a very hippie mentality, so what drives our business is what's fun. This looks cool. Let's see what we can do with it. Marry the passion with the people who have the soft skills. At the small business level, he just doesn't really care what the competition is doing. Be yourself, worry about putting out a great product or service, and your customers will like that. The business is a game, and in any game you play, you have to, have, you have to be able to keep score. So we look at revenue and profitability. Um, he looks at what he loves doing, and that determines the criteria for the business. Um, he wants to give someone a cappuccino because they do business with them, not to get their business. Culture is what keeps employees. Um, we don't use the words market research, but if something new comes out, we've got it. We experience it ourselves and then apply it. Ninety percent of their business is repeat in some manner, so it's about staying in touch and communicating. Um, like what he said in his Dell example, timing over many years of being consistent can ultimately pay off. Timing can be everything. Partnerships are very underrated. And go make the guys at Dell happy, and they'll open their books for you. All right. Uh, for David, I have, uh, make sure your product service is scalable. Spend time with your clients. They have wonderful ideas. And use their ideas to stay ahead of the competition. Uh, value proposition is key in staying ahead. When culture is maintained and employees are proud to be a part of your company, that's what makes you sustainable. Always keep moving, move fast, and it's very hard to be copied. And lastly, timing is crucial in staying sustainable. Thank, thank you, Jane. So we have something um, for you for your for joining us, and we hope to see you again.